We have everybody we need, I guess. Okay, we will call to order at uh, 6.30 uh, p.m. Uh, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to, to the, the flag of the United States, States of America and, and to, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, with that we'll have roll call. Commissioner Freiberger is absent. Commissioner Penno? Here. Here. Commissioner Johnson? Present. Commissioner Frenette? Here. Commissioner Maddox? Absent. Commissioner Fatizi? Present. Commissioner Huggins? Absent. With that, we will move on to the minutes from the June 21st, 20, 2022 meeting. Has everybody had the opportunity to take a look? So I'm going to go from left to right. Commissioner Penno, do you have any uh, comments regarding the uh, consent agenda? Um, my only comment is my name's spelled with an E. It doesn't have an E. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Just wanted to mention it. <laughs> Commissioner Johnson. But I did spell your name with a C that day. You did, so it's only fair. Right. No comments or changes. <laughs> Commissioner Frenette. No comments. I don't have any as well. So with that, would someone like to make a motion to approve? I'll make the motion to approve the minutes. Commissioner Penno has made a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Johnson. Do we have any further discussion? The answer is no. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? None. Motion carries with the amendment to change Commissioner Penno's last name <laughs> to the correct spelling. Thank you. Moving on, general public comments. So in this particular uh, section, prior to opening the general public comments uh, section, I'd like to uh, read out some guidelines. If anyone wishes to speak, please limit comments to three minutes or less. Comments may also be submitted via email or mail ahead of the hearing, uh, uh, excuse me, ahead of the general comment section and read into the record. The instructions to submit comments prior to planning commission meetings are published on our agenda. So if you would like to speak tonight, please state your name and address or any group or organization you represent. I will open the general com public comments section at 6.33 p.m. With that, do we have any emails or mail to be read into the record? The answer is no. No. Okay, thank you. Do we have any audience members wishing to speak? <laughs> there's nobody, there's, there's nobody here. online, and okay. there's nobody in the room. And final question, do we have any online audience members wishing to speak? And that would be a no as well. I will now close the general public comment section at 6.34 p.m. So with that moving along, we have no public hearings on the agenda tonight. No unfinished business. So with that, on to the new business, I would like to open it with item number one, possible amendments to Title 17 SWMC to address retail uses associated with breweries, distilleries, and wineries in the industrial commercial zone. That was detailed in a memo from uh, Assistant Planner Nicole McGowan, dated August 16th, 2022. The subject, amendments to SWMC 17.04.030 to define alcohol production establishment. Amendments to SWMC 17.20.010 and 17.28.010 to add alcohol production establishments as a permitted use in the mixed commercial and industrial zones, amendments to SWMC 17.24.010 to add alcohol production establishments as a conditional use in the central business district zone. With that, Planning Director Coleman, you got the floor. All right, so the title kind of says a lot there. 
doesn't it? I know. <laughs> kind of covers it all. So the idea of this proposed amendment is, uh, is born from some concepts that the Business Development Committee of the Council and staff were working on to uh, improve, uh, you know, to, to make more uh, opportunities for businesses in, in Cedar Woolley. So one thing that we noticed is uh, in our code, if someone were to uh, propose a brewery in town, that uh, a brewery is really an industrial facility. So uh, breweries, by definition, as a production facility, belong in the industrial zone, strictly speaking, by zoning code. So uh, when you put a brewery in, in the industrial zone, that's all well and good. You got trucks delivering during the day and night and uh, a little bit, little bit of sour smell once in a while and some waste products. And it's not really a, it's a pretty light use, but you know, better than in, you know, some of those uses may have an impact on a residential or, or the central business district, for example. So that's its best use. And that's kind of assuming they're big, they're large scale breweries historically when zoning codes were written in the 80s and 70s were big facilities uh, so we're trying to catch up with today's current uh, brewery situation uh, now we see brew pubs which are you know small breweries um, anywhere from you know five barrel system to you know a, a, a giant facility um, Generally, they're still allowed in, uh, any of those uses are allowed in the industrial zone. However, now associated with breweries, you have tasting rooms or tap rooms, as they sometimes are called, and often restaurants. And then in other situations, there's recreation involved, um, outdoor, you know, like game area and places for people to ha hang out. And um, those uses are not allowed in their industrial zone, the way our industrial zone code reads. So uh, our code was kind of blocking uh, brew pubs from occurring in the industrial zone. So we wanted to address that. We want to make sure that places like uh, you know, Westside Brewing in, in Mount Vernon is probably one that you guys are all familiar with um, would be allowed. Um, and if you're familiar with Skagit Brewing, uh, Skagit River Brewing in downtown Mount Vernon, so that might be, that would that would not be allowed in the industrial zone either. Nor would it be allowed in the central business district. So, we thought, hey, let's let's take a look at these issues. Planning Commission's pretty good at at uh, hashing these things out and seeing if we can come up with some uh, corrections. It was first envisioned like, oh well, let's just throw a rider on the definition of uh, the industrial or in the industrial zoning code, saying, you know, breweries. Uh, could have restaurants and tasting rooms. And then, of course, as we, as Nicole was putting this together, she was reading other stuff and doing research and realized, like, well, duh, this also applies to wineries and distilleries. So, oh, okay, well, let's broaden it out now. So Nicole wrote this to apply to, uh, bre to wineries and distilleries as well as breweries, um, which is a fantastic idea. Uh, and then she was looking at the structure of other codes, and uh, so it kind of led one thing to another. To we felt it would be the the best fix of, would be to define alcohol. I can't even remember what we defined it as: alcohol production establishments. And then now that we have a definition of an alcohol production establishment, we can include that in each of the uh, specific zones as an allowed or conditional use and put some bounds on those. And so some of the things we were kicking around is, uh, you know, clearly in the industrial zone, what, what the business development committee and, and what staff was envisioning was, you know, anything goes. Like if you're a brewery and you have uh, the five barrel system there, but you want a three acre playground, adult playground where people go and eat and drink and 
there's a restaurant and and you know cornhole and bocce ball and I don't know if anybody's been to uh, Twin Sisters in Bellingham. That's a pretty good example. It's uh, they've got a small brewing facility on part of the property, but it's probably five percent of their overall site. The rest is um, hangout areas, nice outdoor seating, giant building with a restaurant uh, and. 30 foot ceilings is a former warehouse. Um, like, why would we want to block something like that from happening? It, that would bring a lot of people to the industrial zone, which could have impacts in the industrial zone, but mostly at night, off hours from when industrial stuff is working. So, we do want to keep in mind that sometimes uh, having a lot of people could affect uh, coming in for something like that may affect industrial uses, but uh, largely hours are different and the benefits may outweigh the 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 impacts on the the industrial uh, uses in the area. So that that's something that the that's a that's a decision that the planning commission and city council will ultimately make. Um, but uh, it seems like allowing pretty much any any restaurants and, and tap room tasting rooms associated with wineries, breweries, and distilleries in the industrial zone is kind of a, that seems like where we want to go. And then we began kind of expanding on the concept of, okay, well, do we want a, like a brew facility, a brew pub, or a, a winery and tasting room to be allowed in the mixed commercial zone? Well, you know, let's let's think about that more. And so we wanted to get that concept, you know, we haven't fully developed that, uh, but wanted to run that by the Planning Commission and give you some opportunity to think about what are the impacts of if you have a, a winery or a brew pub in the mixed commercial zone. It could be a good thing. If the tasting room, if it was just a restaurant or a restaurant or brew, uh, a tap, tap room, it'd totally be allowed in the mixed commercial zone. So what would in theory, then, what the impacts would be the brewery on the mixed commercial zone. So, you know, right off the top of the head, you might think, okay, well, maybe we just restrict the size of the brew part of something like that in the mixed commercial zone. So you'll see that uh, on the third, fourth page here when we get into um, the use restrictions in... Uh, Chapter 1720, which is the mixed commercial zone. Under permitted uses, alcohol production establishments that provide building floor area designed for alcohol production activities does not exceed 3,000 square feet. So that was our first blush of a number uh, of limiting, like kind of under this concept of like allow all the ancillary parts of the, the tasting and, and restaurant, but restrict the, the brewing part so it doesn't become a massive production facility in the mixed commercial zone. That may, be, that may not be necessary. Um, I mean, we do currently, I'm just kind of gaming this out in my head. In, in our mixed commercial zone, you can see other allowed uses include uh, da, 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 light manufacturing. So it, Light manufacturing is allowed. We don't have a good definition for light manufacturing, unfortunately. Uh, so does that include breweries? You know, I probably could liberally interpret that to include brewing facilities or winery facilities or distilling. Distilling facilities, facilities are small. And you know, shake your head yes or no if, I, if I'm wrong about that. In comparison to brew facilities tend to be very big. Wineries are kind of all over the place, depending on how they use their space. They can be fairly small, but uh, go down to Woodenville and see what the the winery facilities down there are like. And a lot of those aren't. A lot of those are more just tasting rooms. They're not doing a lot of the the wine making stuff in that down in that area down by the slough. But if you go to their industrial zone, where they are doing some of the okay, yeah. no, Jen, well, Jen, Jenuk's down by the slough. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. They, and that's a that's, that's, that's a massive business. facility. And I haven't been in that one. Are they? Yeah, are they? Are they? 
I've been down there a lot. The Are, do Mills, they make wine there? Are they actually producing they, wine there? The answer is yes, and they, they bring the grapes in from eastern Washington. I mean, I want to say Chateau Saint-Michel, and, and it's more like they, they still pull most of their stuff out of western eastern Washington. Yeah. But and, that's just there for display only, really, when right. you think about it. But, uh, but Genic, one of my favorite Okay, Genic is, is a larger facility say. down there that is its own building. It's not just a tasting room. It's a it's a nice it's a very nice hangout spot, um, and I think it's big enough. And according to Commissioner Fatizi, it sounds like they're also doing some uh, wine production there. You know, and on the brewery side too, if you look at Red Hook, or it used to be Red Hook, that's right next door to it. That would right. be something that would be a nice fit in our industrial area because we got the space for it to do something on that both scales. Yeah. This is a great discussion, by the way. And Go on. Yeah. Then there's another part of Woodenville, their industrial zone, um, which is kind of your basic tilt-up, one-story industrial facilities. Um, and you can occupy as much space in a you know, 500-foot-long building as you want. The answer is yes. And, yeah. and that, those places, that's where they're actually doing some, that's where they're actually doing their small-scale production and they don't; those don't take up a lot of space either. When when you're talking about 2,000 cases a year for most of these places, is where they kind of that's kind of a natural break point, two to three thousand cases per year for a startup. Um, and then beyond that, they they start to become a different animal. Um, so those smaller ones, very small impact. Brew facility can be larger. Um, and has a little bit more, a little bit more input, a little bit more uh, waste than these other facilities. You know, when they put the mash out there, there's this giant. If you've ever been to Aslan, you can see they bring it out by the truck, by the, the, the forklift load, and it's kind of a nasty, sour thing. But it's it's not a big deal. Um, so maybe uh, planning commission members should uh, do some self education. Uh, Head out to some different sized breweries in the area over the next couple of weeks and uh, see what it looks like. Um, we did something like this uh, with some of the, the with some of the uh, city staff a few years ago when we went to Aslan, which is a pretty good example because they've got a their production facility there and a dining area. Culshin Two over on uh, Kentucky Street is a very big production facility and canning facility with a small tasting room out front. Um, and I mean, that would, I mean, if we could get something like that, that would, you know, any of these would be a great starter in the industrial zone, but we might also like to allow them in commercial areas. So we'll do some more research as staff to see where these sorts of things are and are not allowed in other jurisdictions zones um, most of them have been in industrial zone in my my understanding of these things so we definitely want to make sure that they're allowed in our industrial zone um, and then look at expanding it from there and look at maybe putting some balance on how big the production part of some of these might be it may not it may not be a concern at all until we start to look at uh, chapter 1724, which is our central business district. Um, right now, alcohol serving establishments are a conditional use permit in, in the central business district. And as in the staff report points out, an alcohol serving establishment is a business licensed to allow on-premises consumption of wine or beer where the sale and premises sale and on-premises consumption of said product is the prime source more than 50 percent of revenue for the premises it's not meant to include restaurants where food is prepared and served on the premise, premises and where the sale of liquor wine or beer is incidental to and not the prime source of revenue for the premises now that definition itself is a whole nother ball of wax like that could that could be potentially is what is the bullpen? Is that a alcohol serving establishment or is that a restaurant? Because um, it's kind of it, 
it's, it's, I'm not going to ask them for the receipts to see which one they make more money on, right? But it's, it might be close. Um, same with uh, the one across the street, the Iron Mountain. I mean, they're. Can you be any age to be in the, those places you mm -hmm. mentioned? Yes. And the LCB has, you know, various areas. Usually when you go into a place like that, there'll be a bar, uh, like a rail near the bar, and kids aren't allowed at the bar, um, or kids might not be allowed after a certain hour at all in a facility like that. But I digress a little. Um, no, but you're right, though. That, that, that's worth pointing out, by the way. It's just a, a regular just wooden bar would have a barrier between the bar and the regular dining area where alcohol and everything served like any other restaurant. But, yeah, and that, that's always a, a big thing, too, when, when you start talking about uh, the, the microbrewery-style uh, business model. It's gotten so popular, and I've <laughs> run the, uh, the so-called tour of duty on many of them. From Kenmore, we have Brewery Row, that that whole section of Bothell Everett Highway is nothing but all these little microbrews. And then you hit Woodenville, where you have the industrial stuff, as well as all the tasting room things. So as soon as I saw this, I was like, this is about time. That's the, the note I have here. This is good stuff that really lends itself to what we got going on here. I like this conversation, It, by it the would way. be, I think it would be very helpful if we were to do a planning commission uh, field trip? Road trip, you bet. Absolutely. However, I, I don't know how that would really look <laughs> to have like a city sponsored brewery tour. So, so I, in, uh, instead of sponsoring a, a, a trip of, of planning commissioners to uh, breweries and wineries, I, I will encourage the planning commissioners to, to make some individual trips to these places. Um, the the winery area, the the tasting room area in Woodenville is eye opening. Yeah, it's great. It yeah. is. Uh, I mean, in a way, people could say it's a victim of its own success. Like, good luck parking down there. It, it you need reservations at most of these tasting rooms on weekends. They are they are doing very well. Yep. If we could have something like that spring up in Cedra Woolley. Uh, we'd probably be happy to figure out the impacts, uh, how to address the impacts. But first, let's take some baby steps and, and l at least make it possible for something like that to happen. Um, so that's what we're trying to do now. I think, I think visiting some of the various different breweries, brew pubs, is, is a good idea, too. There's... Um, you know, there's only the two in Mount Vernon that I can think of. Uh, there's probably 15 or so in Bellingham that I, that I could point the planning commission to. You bet. And they're all varying sizes. I mean, we went to um, uh, Menace, which is a seven-barrel system, and it's a former garage, uh, like mechanics garage, it's probably not a whole lot bigger than this room that we're in. And the seven barrel system takes up the space between where staff sits and, and where you guys sit. It's a, it's a small area. And then the rest is uh, just seating for people that uh, are visiting and, and a small bar. So these things can be very small like that, or they can be very big like, uh, the Culsion 2 or the uh, Twin Sisters, which is something to see. It's really taken it to a new level as far as a place for people to congregate and uh, family friendly with food. I, I, think, I think our business development committee would, would like to see something like that happen in the city. So that's where we're going with this. I wanted you to wanted the Planning Commission to understand uh, what these places look like, um, understand what we're trying to achieve. We've made some recommendations here. That doesn't mean that this is set in stone. We really want to have the, some Planning Commission feedback on this before we go and have a public hearing.
I have one question and one comment. Do we currently have any breweries or distilleries in any of our industrial areas right now? No. Okay. The next comment would be, I'm sure most of Cedar Woolley would just love another bar. <laughs> Sorry. That's how I feel about it. I mean, you know, on one end of it, everybody's complaining we have all these bars downtown and all the trouble that they cause. I just can't. To me, it's just going to be another bar. I, I would counter that, actually, that breweries, by and large, tend not to have any of the social markings of a bar. Even though they're both alcohol-centered establishments, breweries... They're playing games and cornhole and drinking bre and breweries. Breweries, yeah, but it's a totally different atmosphere, and oftentimes it's it attracts a, a Are different. Are you still client. trying to open a brewery? I'm not going to go on the record about that. Okay, but I still I know breweries, and I can tell you that they are a much much different animal than a bar. And anybody yeah, that says yeah. otherwise, animal is probably the correct word. The but okay. the the only. <laughs> Those who would say otherwise, I don't think, understand breweries or have experienced them enough. Um, a question that I have as far as the uh, definition. So that was kind of you, an issue that you brought up was, um, you know, when does one evolve into the other as far as, like, primarily brewery versus primarily uh, food establishment? Because, you know, the nature of microbrews tend to be startups and kind of entrepreneurial and you know they have a tendency to evolve very quickly so you know you could i could easily see you starting out either way kind of with you know very very small production of beer for just in-house having something successful it blows up and then suddenly you're primarily brewing beer or distilling um, or you know you start out primarily as just like a, a brew facility and then you just want to add food to kind of keep butts in seats while they they drink your brew and you know that menu just eventually expands and so I while I like the definitions here you know that is a hesitation that I have is kind of like putting it into a context of percentages, but you know, I, I also know that um, you know there's the whole liquor control board aspect because I think that they also put additional uh, percentage requirements on on these sorts of facilities. Um, just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on that, and then um, you know. Later on, I kind of wanted to also um, touch on the base of, you know, square footage because, again, being kind of startup entrepreneurial, like, there's, it runs the gamut and you kind of are naturally limited on your space because, I mean, Brewers don't necessarily want to work in a very confined area if you're rapidly expanding. So kind of what you see if you do expand a certain square footage of, you know, industrial element to the brewery just kind of becomes inadequate or not ideal for commercial. So you'd, I think you would tend towards just going to an industrial location anyways, at least as far as either your primary brewing or additional brewing. So I was kind of, I mean, I know you said it was kind of the first stab at square footage, and I, I was just kind of wondering if square footage was even a necessary element that we needed to, to broach. Can I throw this out there? Uh, I think where you're going here is, which is a really good direction, on the industrial side, there, there wouldn't be a, it's industrial, right? So that, that's a different animal than doing a, uh, a brew pub in a mixed commercial where 3,000 square feet is a lot of square feet. 
for uh, the mixed commercials, and I'm trying to even think of what kind of building we even have right now that has 300, 3,000 square feet plus a restaurant element. I don't. I, I can't see too many buildings we even have right now that could accommodate that. But anyway, so but I, I think we're. I think we're kind of getting at the same point though. Is like, I don't think you even need to put in a square footage because you know as far like there's an industrial element to a brew pub i mean with a tasting room you have a commercial that's the commercial element the the brewing is an industrial element to it right and so at a certain point the industrial um, element expands to a point where you know it's just not tenable to use a a certain space and what you often see when that happens is those breweries end up either shifting all of their production to an industrial area that's more accommodating is just as far as like flow and logistics um, and space and storage and waste. Um, do you see what I'm saying there? Yeah, I'm just thinking the industrial zone is, is, is different than a mixed commercial for looking at a different style where <clears throat> For instance, if you're doing, let's say, a Boundary Bay kind of setup, that would be an example that I think we're both familiar with, where they have that whole production facility there on the, on the left-hand side. That is in no way even close to 3,000 square feet. So what I'm saying is the production space, if you limit that to 3,000 square feet, and that's not inclusive of the restaurant tasting or anything like that, I'm talking pure production, 3,000 square feet is a lot of square footage in a mixed commercial zone outside of if you go in... But, you know, we were using the example of Janik on the, on the winery side up in Woodenville where you have the, the, the consumer part of it, but then you have that whole production facility. But then, you know, you just go three minutes away and you have the tasting room aspect of it. They, they're just like, they, they actually made it work out there. So I, I see field trips in our, in our future, and it doesn't mean to consume the beverage, but just to see what other jurisdictions have done. Kenmore did a really nice thing on Brewery Row. Like I said, that whole section has got to be about 10 ones down there now, and they're still adding into them. And then you go into Woodenville where you're going to start hitting the uh, wine uh, side of it. So yeah, there's some great examples out there of both. Yeah. So I'm not saying yes, no, or anything. I'm just saying, yeah, there, there's good examples out there, even here in Bellingham. If any place you want to talk about breweries, Bellingham is an incredible resource. So. so to answer some of the things that came up, so alcohol serving establishment is, is meant to control bars. And the definition is an attempt to differentiate a, between a bar and a restaurant that serves alcohol. Um, so in the, in, and it really just comes into play in the central business district because alcohol serving establishments are a conditional use in the central business district. And that is to address uh, Commissioner Penno's point that, you know, there was too many bars in the CBD. And there were in the, you know, mid thousands, you know, 2000, six to 2011 or so there was a lot of problems downtown and we're in council had enough and made alcohol serving establishments a, a, a conditional use just so we didn't get any more bars downtown and, and continue to feed on the, the the nightlife problems that were happening primarily after midnight um it was it was it was problematic. Uh, I know a lot of you are around where you know, windows were getting broken weekly, storefront windows were getting broken. Um, the police were breaking up fights. Police were getting hurt because they were involved in, in brawls out in front. Um, there was over serving problems. So that problem cleared up when a couple of places went away um, and we still have in place this alcohol serving establishment rule and definition to differentiate a bar and a, a bar and a restaurant. We want restaurants downtown. 
we don't want trouble bars downtown. So uh, that's why it was made a conditional use permit. The tap room, uh, the local 20 needed to get a conditional use permit to go in because they don't serve food. Um, and one of the reasons they were allowed is, you know, I forget what the specific conditions, but they close early and that, that tamps down almost all of the problems. Not gonna say that there's never any problems at, at tap rooms, uh, but I, I generally don't see any problems. The problems occur late at night. And that's one of the reasons that brew pubs have such a good reputation and they, they're not known for all of the problems and bad things that go on. Is they generally close early, 10 o'clock frequently. Um, so that's why we have an alcohol serving establishment definition. Alcohol production establishment is strictly, you know, that is someplace that produces alcohol, brewery, winery, distillery. And then to address the problem in the industrial zone and not allowing food and, and tasting rooms, we wrote into it, food and alcohol beverage may be allowed accessory to such establishments. So what we're saying is an alcohol servicing establishment, and I, can, and I can appreciate where there's confusion between the two definitions. So I, I'm gonna recommend that we say, at the end of the alcohol production establishment definition, uh, say alcohol production establishments are not the same as alcohol serving establishments. So it's clear, like alcohol servicing establishment is a bar. Alcohol producing establishment is a brewery, winery, or distillery that allows um, tasting rooms and restaurants. So there is a differentiation there. Um, yeah. I don't know a lot about this stuff because I don't go anywhere to drink beer. But the Rockfish Bar and Grill seems to me, I was in there watching my friend play music, and there's something about a brewery attached to it or something. Is it a brewery or is it a restaurant or is it a, what's the Rockfish and Anacortes? Rockfish, are they associated with Anacortes Brewing or is that a separate? But you can see barrels right through the window there. It's like part of the restaurant, but they make, I think it's a brewery, isn't it? Well, it's a rockfish bar and grill. So as far as I know that, I don't know. But as far as I know, I, I, w I was under the understanding that that would be some, that would be either a restaurant or a alcohol serving establishment. Okay, because they offer their brew of the day and they make a big deal out of the brewery. Huh? Well, maybe they're brewing their so it's kind of like a hybrid. They're both. Or they brew off site. Says and they that bring they're it in. brewed next door. Right next door. You can see it next door. So Anacortes Brewery is next door. Yeah. Oh, Anacortes. And they're not part of each other? They are in cahoots together. They're in but, cahoots. Yeah, but they're two separate companies. Kind of like Birdview Brewing up here, uh, you know, right outside of concrete. They bring their product all over. You'll find some of their stuff right here in the bullpen. But they did not a really big volume producer. So you do have a lot of arrangements between the different small breweries and yeah. these local distribution channels. So in that one, Anacortes Brewing, it happens to be directly next door to the Rockfish. So they, I think the Rockfish uh, has Anacortes Brewery brew some special stuff for the Rockfish. Okay. This sounds like we're, what we're getting at. I'm not an expert I, and I, I don't spend much time in Anacortes, so I don't know that, yeah. the particulars. Okay. And LaConnor is putting in something called the Firehouse Brewery, ready to open soon-ish, it says. <laughs> and I saw them unloading crates today, getting that up and running. But it used to be the fire station, now it's a brewery. Well, you know, the LaConnor Brewery is a fantastic example. That's been, I thank you for bringing up LaConnor, because that's been kind of a higher-end place it's not high end it's it's a brew pub they brew there and then they serve lunch and dinner and beer of course but it's a it's a family oriented kind of place that's the pizza place 
the, you serve pizza. The, it's called La Conner yeah, it's Brewing. La Conner Brewing. Okay. But it's not big at all, actually. No. Boundary Bay is like five times, ten mm-hmm. times the size of that. Yeah. We'll have to start studying these places. And I thought, I thought that there was a law in Washington State that if you served alcohol, you had to serve food. So those LCB rules change all the time. Oh. Like 30 years ago, yeah, like you couldn't serve you couldn't serve hard alcohol unless you had a full menu. And then it became a little like you couldn't serve hard alcohol unless you offered food. And you know, that's been watered down to the point where like if you've got a frozen pizza in the back somewhere and a toaster to cook it, like that 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 suffices for the law. Okay. And, so the, the- and these things just keep they those rules change all the time and we don't have as a local jurisdiction, a whole lot. It's hard to hard to build our rules around those rules because we don't have any control over how, what happens. Okay, because so I was surprised when you said the tap house doesn't serve food. I thought that was mandatory, but I guess there's a loophole there. Well, and they don't serve hard alcohol either. Oh, that's just beer, okay. I think way back when it might have been just even to serve beer you needed food, but um, and it may be that because they've got a rack of chips on the wall behind, <laughs> that may suffice too. It honestly might, because uh, I know it's gotten quite watered down. Yeah, what, what they do now over there is they have a list of local places like Domino's and a bunch of places that you just go to your app or just call them up or whatever. They got a little number for them, and they just come and they deliver it straight to it, and it's oh. usually within a couple minutes. So if you want a pizza, Domino's is just going to bring it on over in just a couple minutes. Mm-hmm. So that, that's how they, they run that for the, the food side. But, you know, not, not for anything. From a, a commercial basis, kitchens cost a fortune. Mm-hmm. So, so from that perspective, to have somebody else deliver the food, mm-hmm. and all you have to do is worry about your high-margin stuff, which is your beverages, yeah, that, that, that's a win-win for everybody because you have a lot of local places that are more than happy to bring the food by. But the cost of a commercial kitchen, i got to tell you right now, is, 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 is probably one of the biggest expenses if you're going to open up any type of restaurant or brewery or whatever. The money's in that kitchen. You need all kinds of fire prevention. I'm not even going to get into it. You yeah. can drop 100 grand like that. Right. Don't even talk about the plumbing. Right? So I, I think what we can say from this is there's lots of ways that breweries and tasting rooms can can the way they can look they can be small they can not have food and allow food to be brought in they can be a a restaurant and a tasting room um in which case they don't allow outside food in right um yeah you can be a giant brewing facility like Rainier Brewing um, I don't I don't think we have enough space in our commercial zone for something like that to come in but right now uh, you know just a straight up massive 50,000 square foot brewing facility would definitely be allowed in our uh, in our industrial zone they'd be allowed five uh, percent of their entire site to be for retail and and service so that that's kind of the limiting factor in the industrial zone is you only allowed five percent retail and and service so like a tasting room would be very small if you uh even for a larger facility (laughs) so the definition for alcohol production establishment right now says that food and alcohol beverage service may be allowed accessory to such establishments. So if you have it in the CBD, um, you know, you could have the brewery just without that, you know, it just says may be allowed. So I'm thinking just because if you're wanting to bring people into the CBD, you probably want that public space. Should we add that in conditional use? Let me look at it. Nicole, can you repeat what you just said? I'm Sorry, just I was just... No, 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 no. no. <laughs> right. I'm following you. No, I just want to know. Go ahead. You're right. You're no, right. So You're going in down the, the right CBD, um, you know, the whole idea is you want to bring the public, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm looking at this definition that we have for alcohol production establishment. 
and it says that food and or alcohol beverage service may be allowed accessory to such establishments. But should we specify that in the CBD that they have to have that instead of just may? In my opinion, yes, as well as in the mixed commercial, yeah. Yeah. Instead of maybe shall? Yeah. Well, we don't, in the definition, we don't want to say Not in shell. the definition, but okay. specify the under the thing, conditional use. That was one of the other yeah. things that, that Commissioner Johnson had brought up is that if, you, if you're a startup company, you don't want anything to do with food and tasting rooms, yeah, go ahead. You're not required to have those things. You can just have your brew facility or your, your distillery or whatever it is. Um, but yeah, uh, so we think food is a requirement, should be a requirement of any, of any um, alcohol production establishments in the CBD and still be conditionally used. I'm trying to remember the, the brewery in uh, downtown Snohomish. And I think they just have like a one barrel system in the back and they don't have any food. I mean, they're, the, the space that the old library was on on the corner of Woodworth and Metcalf, you know, that open space there, I mean, their, their establishment in downtown Snohomish is like half of that. And it includes their their brew facility, do they and, have, and they don't they don't serve any food. It's just beer. Do they have any other kind of public thing like a like a facility tour or something like that? Just no. No, I mean, uh, well, no. Most most jurisdictions probably don't have rules against just bars in their CBDs. That's that's something that's probably fairly unique to Cedar Woolley, at least making them a conditional use permit. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's common to require a conditional use permit for bars. But this isn't just a bar though. I mean, they're actually, they brew everything there. I mean, that is their brew facility. Do they have a tasting facility too? I mean, it's, the the back of it is the brew facility and the front of it is like a like a cafe style, you know, drinking area. Like you just have like high tables and you could probably fit 20 people in there, maybe 20 customers. This sounds yeah. like structures in Bellingham. Yeah. And this was in Snohomish. But same scale. Yeah. Very limited number of people in the mm -hmm. front very small scale production. Mm -hmm. So it just goes to illustrate that there's a lot of ways these places can exist. So have we, uh, have we worked on this long enough? Should staff just, we don't have a lot of, we don't, we're missing three planning commission members. So I don't know if we're going to be ready for a public hearing next time anyway, but um, I think we, Got some, got some good info to go on, and uh, unless the planning commission wants to it, put anything more into this, you know, there, there's so many great examples out there of all these different uh, business models from the uh, the winery tasting rooms, and, and like I said, Woodenville would be probably at the top of the list for me and my former office was down there I'm, I'm there all the time so it, it, it's a real and just watching how that evolved really over the past I want to say 15 years really is remarkable and they really have it dialed in like John said parking is an issue a lot of people park over where the uh, the ball fields are and they'll, they'll walk into town then you have the industrial aspect of it just on the other side of the slough that is, that is industrial. And that's where a lot of the small distilleries are at, by the way. So that's how they filled up a lot of the, uh, the warehouse space. It isn't just like uh, when, where Chateau St. Michel is. I mean, you're familiar with the area. So you have like the uh, original, I think it's a whiskey distillery. I forget the brand right there. Right before you would make the left to downtown and Chateau Saint-Michel is there. But when you go all the way down along the slough, all that warehouse space, there's a whole bunch of tiny little distilleries in there that people volunteer to work in them and they get 
deals on stuff. So it's quite a vibrant industry that really occupies a lot of different types of uh, spaces, whether it's a mixed commercial, industrial. There's just a lot of opportunity for A, businesses, B, uh, generating revenue for uh, cities and actually putting in something that uh, I kind of like myself. It's not like you sitting around getting, uh, you know, like in some of the local places, uh, you know, you just, it, it, it's, it's, it's a different experience. So there's a lot of great examples out there. So I'm, gl I'm glad we're really talking about this because I think what we have up here is mountains. We, we have the most incredible environment up here that uh, would really be, this would be a really good fit for what we have going on. So anyway, I'm done. Ready to move on? Okay. On new business number two, possible amendments to SWMC 17.04.030, definitions to define live and work unit. So that is defined on memo dated August 16th, 2022. Nicole McGowan, assistant planner, author, subject amendments to chapter 1704 SWMC to add a definition for live work unit and amendments to chapter 17.20 and 17.28 SWMC to specify parking requirements for live work units. Mr. Coleman. Okay, so um, some people in CG Rolly may be familiar with the term live work unit. It's uh, currently allowed in the industrial zone and the mixed commercial zone. And what a live work unit is, um, is not defined in our code. It says they're allowed and it's sort of presumed what, what they are. Um, we have some right across the way here. Um, and the way we require them is that they have one ownership, and one lease space, uh, the bottom floor being commercial and the upper floor being residential. And the idea is whoever lives in the residential part works in the commercial part. So it's different than say a downtown building where you've got the commercial downstairs and then apartments above. So in a situation like that, anybody could live upstairs, unrelated to the business downstairs, um, and anybody could lease out the space, the commercial space downstairs. That's, that's just a regular uh, mixed commercial. Live work is, intended to be where someone lives and works and the building code is actually different for something like that. So it, it doesn't have the same fire separation uh, that a, a mixed commercial does. It still will have sprinklers and it'll still have ADA um, uh, requirements for the commercial down below like any commercial space would. But in the upstairs, um, there's, there's not the same fire separation because the theory is it's, it's, it's all your unit. So in a regular single family home, you don't have fire separation between you and your space downstairs. So it's a cross between residential and a, and a mixed use, mixed commercial type situation. But that's not described in our code. So uh, Nicole looked at, mixed, uh, looked at live work unit rec uh, requirements for other jurisdictions and put together some proposed definitions. And also while she was looking at it, figure a day, we better, we better figure out uh, parking for these two and, and specify how parking is regulated for these units because they're not, they're not currently addressed. Parking for these aren't currently addressed in our, in our code. So that's what we've proposed for the Planning Commission to review. Um, Tacoma has a pretty good uh, explanation of it. They also have a tip sheet that people can, you can hand out to people and say, this is what a live work unit is, explaining what I just said. Uh, and hopefully the definition that Nicole's put together 
tells you exactly what it is, and there should be no ambiguity and no confusion as to how these are operated, what are your responsibilities and as, a, as an owner. Because um, it can be challenging for staff to then regulate these as somebody just moves into the downstairs part and we'd have to go knock on the door and say, hey, you're in a live work unit and you, know, you need to know that you're not, you're not allowed to live in this. This is a commercial area, you, you can't live here. The reason I think <laughs> that uh, live work units are allowed in the mixed commercial zone is sort of like a transition between commercial areas and residential neighborhoods. And, you know, in theory, there's commercial portion to it. So if there's commercial portion, you don't want that in residential neighborhoods. So we wanted to give people, I think we want, these, these were put into, the, the allowance for live work units was put into place before I started here, so more than 16 years ago. So I don't know if Commissioner Huggins was here, maybe he could give us some further insight into it. So it'll be interesting to see what uh, his uh, institutional memory is on the live work unit situation. But what we want to do is create some clarity, uh, some clarity so staff and people who are building and buying and living in these know exactly what is and is not allowed. <clears throat> Hopefully you've looked at the, it's, it's you know, a half a page long, it's pretty simple. I don't really need to feel the need to read it to you. Um, hopefully the way I've described it is, is reflected in the code. Uh, and then we also went on to say, live work, uh, address the parking part. And so the live work units shall provide parking per the table above uh, for the residential units based on the number of bedrooms in the unit. Live work units shall also provide commercial parking spaces per the development standards in Cedar Rolling Municipal Code 1736030. So what that says is in the mixed commercial zone, we already have regulations for how many parking spaces you need per residential unit. So if you have got a two bedroom unit, you provide two spaces. If you have one bedroom unit, you still provide two spaces. Three bedrooms, three, et cetera. Um, so that's just saying, if you've got a two bedroom, three bedroom, say you have a three bedroom live work unit, uh, uh, you, you need three residential parking spaces. And then you, for the commercial spot down below, say it's 800 square feet of in uh, retail. So you go to the, the parking chapter in 1736 and says, okay, retail parking requires one parking per, you know, 600 for 500 square feet. So they would be required to have one or maybe two commercial parking spaces as well. So that is the long and short of this one. Well, there, wasn't, uh, there wasn't anything in the industrial zone to address parking for residential because residential is not allowed in the industrial zone except for in these cases. So Nicole put together uh, a new section, that's the, the, the one that's underlined at, at the very end of the, of the memo on the last page where we had to basically recreate exactly what I read to you from that previous uh, mixed commercial chapter in the industrial zone just to address live work units. I walked over there once when it was, uh, they had an open house or something. Abbott's Alley, what it's called. Uh -huh. Seems to me there was only one parking spot per unit or something. Is there more than, was I missing something? I think there's two. Two. Yeah. I think they're tandem spots, though. It's one, but it, it's tandem. Oh, right. No, they're, they're, they're double? I, I think they're Cause double. Because I've been over there as well. For some reason, uh, I thought it was. My, re uh, my recollection is that every space should. <sighs> I think they're tandem. But they're just... probably one bedroom. 
So one spot for the one bedroom and then one spot for the 600 square foot commercial. Well, space. so those were built, these are proposed rules. Oh, right. But they had to build it to something, some kind of rule. Right. And we just kind of, <laughs> kind of figured something out. And I don't like just figuring stuff out. Yeah. I, I like to just be able to look at the code and say, this is what you're required to do. Let's not, yeah. let's not have to not like, negotiate no or, negotiation. or create, uh, re, uh, create the wheel here. And so the street doesn't count over there. All parking is uh, off, off street. So you, you don't get to use city parking as the required parking for your development. Yeah. So everybody want, everybody asks. Commissioner Penno or Commissioner Johnson, anybody like to add anything into this? I'm good. Um, the five non-residential workers or employees portion, is there, uh, I mean, who was it? Was it Seattle? Which number is it? Uh, number five? Number five, yeah. Like that. Um, I saw it in one of these examples. Not finding it at the moment, but is there like, is there logic behind that? Oh, it, it looks like it's, it's the beginning of the second page, number four. Yeah, it was at Bellingham. Number four, then five non residential workers or employees are allowed. And that was. I think the mm -hmm. idea is live work units are meant to sustain small places studios, boutique uh, chocolatiers, um, a plumber's uh, company, you know, a small scale, you know, maybe a self-employed plumber. It's, they're not really intended to be a big industrial or, or, uh, or sales facility. So I think that's where that comes from. Like trying to limit the contact between commercial and residential for fire purposes. Um, but if you don't think that's necessary. Yeah, I was just curious what the, the logic was behind it. Parking? You know, I had this comment that I made because. Be parking. So anyway, that is the forward trend, given uh, technology-based professions, businesses that are easily accommodated by that type of uh, a model. But you have two different kinds, right? The clients need to be present, okay, in a business, like in a tech business. You might not. You're there by yourself. I can think of tech, potentially an art gallery, other professional services, accounting, legal, real estate. You're not going to have any clients there, but you might have other types of services like personal services, like personal training, yoga, massage therapy, where you're going to have clients visiting that particular site. So I just came up with this one question. Do clients need to be present X percent of the time? And what's X, right? So we, we can't regulate that. And I know I'm just throwing it out so, there. That, that's pretty so much it. No, that, that's not envisioned. Um, I really like the examples that you gave. Yoga studios, you know, small scale. It's like somebody who's, you know, just they have 10 people in their class. Right. That's, you, can, you can do that in, right across the street right. here, right? Um, or, or a workout studio where you've got mm -hmm. five, five people in. Your, your garage, a garage at a single family house right. is a little too small, but a facility like this. Is but parking, that's the whole thing. That, that, that's the question, right? Parking. Well, you know, yeah. no parking for commercial is perfect. Uh, no, we I, do I the best it. that uh, we can. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, I'm just throwing it out there. That's it. That's all. I read, I read the, 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 the information. That's what, that's what on street <laughs> parking is for, for those overflow of situations uh -huh. where. Yeah, business is doing good. Mm -hmm. So kind of a follow-up to the, the number five question then is with number eight, I mean, the way that's worded, <clears throat> I mean, that could, this could be a very large 
facility. Yeah, 3,000 is pretty big. Where'd you yeah. get the 3,000? I mean, and, that, and that's just the commercial portion. That doesn't even include the, the residential portion as well. Yeah, the residence got to be 3,000 then. Pretty much, yeah. Because 50%. So, I mean, it, if I, I guess where I'm going That's with right. that is if the logic with the five employees, non-residential employees being present on the premises, you know, is supposed to be a, a size inhibitor mechanism. I mean, do we want to decrease that 3,000 square foot number to kind of go in hand in hand with that? Because, I mean, if... If you have a 3,000 square foot commercial, I'm guessing you're gonna have more than five non-residential employees there. It stands to reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of space. Oh yeah. And to be honest with you, regulating the number of employees is also something that we're not gonna be very capable of. No. We can regulate how big things are, because we, you know, permit the building, but we 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 we're not in the business of regulating what people do inside of their buildings. Once they, I mean, the fire department does a little bit of that. Right. Code enforcement does some of that, but it just becomes a whole. It just becomes a lot more challenging. Which right there, there are mechanisms in place, specific, specifically fire code that, based upon the square footage, it can't exceed X amount of. Uh, you know, capacity as far as individuals. And you're right, that's not for you guys to police. And if it gets out of control, then, you know, that, that's a totally different situation. So would the planning commission be amenable to maybe decreasing that to 1,500 or 2,000? I would, yeah. If you want small scale, yeah. But 1,500 square feet is still a significant amount of, of square footage when, yeah, you, when I, you're looking at I'm going to go out on a limb. I think this room is probably pretty close to 1,500 square yeah, feet. Yeah, I would, I would agree. Yeah. And that, that's a significant. Yeah. That's bigger than my house. Then you throw that's it. That's what I'm, I'm like, can I fit my house like in this room? Like, yeah. 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 I can fit my house <laughs> in this room with room to spare. Yeah. You know, that would be a really good thing to know is the, the square footage in this room because... As you're sitting here, you can really envision yeah. what, what you have going on. I mean, I'm, well, I'm, I'm terrible with spatial, so I, I usually go off of this room. <laughs> no, no, seriously. Thinking room is about See if the computer's faster than the foot walker. What do you have, like 75 feet? 15 times 3? 45. 45. 45. Well, you guys can calculate just as well as everybody else can. I'll we'll say 22 paces, so 22 times 3. 66. Six. 66 times 45. I'll give you a square foot. 29, 7. 3,000. 3,907. Yeah. Yeah. Fit my house in here. Yeah. Almost yeah, three yeah. times. So as it's written right now, you could have a commercial space this size. Yeah, which is significant. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So half well, of this is, is you said this what? 2,970. So we'll call this 3,000 square yeah. feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cut that in half. I think in that's reasonable. Man. Doesn't feel like 3,000 square feet. <laughs> now that we said that, it's like hmm, maybe 3,000 is a little bit on the reasonable end. But I don't know. I guess if we're, I mean, what what is the what is the desire? Are we desiring this to be more of a condensed? Because I'd imagine you're not just gonna like build and plop down one live work. I mean, I'm gonna take a venture and say that you're probably building multiple within the same area, right? I mean, that's, that's what I, I tend to see. I'm just going anecdotally here, but I mean, you tend to build three or four or multiple mores than that. So I'd imagine if you're wanting to keep it, 
relatively condensed, maybe even high density, 1,500 or 2,000. I mean, I probably would, if this is 3,000, I probably would even go, go to 2,000. <coughs> but it's split. It's between residential and... Well, the way this is worded, though, is maximum size of commercial portion. No, no, I, 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 I knocked that in half. I'm okay with that. That's 1,500 square feet. That's a lot of square feet. And you have 1,500 square feet of living space. You could put a three-bedroom in 1,500 square feet easily. Easily. Yeah. And they can go three stories. <laughs> oh, 3,000 square foot house above it. <laughs> <laughs> we don't see a lot of those in Cedar Woolley. I mean, technically, with the. As I see it, are like 2,800. I mean, with the way this is written, I mean, technically. The sky is the limit when it comes to the residential portion, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, what it, as long as the fire ladder can reach it, they're golden. I mean, it's kind of limiting, like who's going to build a mansion on right, top of right. a commercial space, <laughs> right? So, I, I, it seems a little self-limiting. But, but ultimately, I guess the concept is the footprint, right? I mean. It, that's kind of where these limiting factors, or at least these alleged limiting factors, are coming into play. I guess, you know, you, you bring up a point like, what are we trying to regulate? Not necessarily, from staff perspective, we don't necessarily see these as good or bad. Um, so we're not, we're not trying to address impacts. Um, some of these seem to be trying to address impacts by limiting the number of persons and the size. Um, I mean, we just kind of put some what seemed like reasonable bounds on it. Um, we don't think they, that a live work unit has particularly good or bad impacts on the neighborhoods that they're allowed. Um, we just, we're just looking to define them so uh, we can make sure that they're occupied the way that they're intended and the way the building code um, intends them to be occupied. And if a person chooses to purchase one of these that is for sale and they decide they want to put their doll collection downstairs and paper on the windows, and not have it open to the public, that's fine too. Say that again? Can, is it mandatory they use the lower space for commercial or can they just board it up and use it for a warehouse? Well, warehouse would be, I mean, if they're warehousing it for using it as a warehouse for their commercial stuff, that, that's great. But we don't want people just living, using these as residential units. That is, is, that is a concern. So should that be established? Um, does it say anything to the effect of the commercial area function shall be limited to the first one? Yes, it should be. Is the answer now? I'm reading through to see if it, if uh, if if it's in here. So if it's not, well, that's a that's a good catch. And I know one business, Santa Cordis, that's open one day a month, no, two days a month, one weekend per month. So is that acceptable? Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. They're doing business out of there. Yeah. And they wouldn't even need to open up. Period. I mean, you could still do a live work where you're not open to the public. There's so many different businesses that nobody's coming on in, mm -hmm. right? I think it's something you'd be doing like online with an eBay kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. That you write, you're storing all different things. So you got the business on the bottom and you're just shipping stuff out the door and you're living on top of it. There's so right. many different models. That so, okay, so you're this. still your business, but nobody's coming and going. Right, yeah, yeah. And that's fine too. Yeah, you bet. 
You just work from home doing that. It's kind of what I do. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody comes knocking on my door. <laughs> But a lot of people do that business model. It's kind of like eBay was one of the first pioneers of that, right? That mm -hmm. you're just shipping stuff out of your garage or, or whatever. So this is just a, Amazon. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll throw something on there. It says something to the effect of the commercial portion shall not be occupied by residential use. You kind of have that in there, like no bathtubs and such. But mm -hmm. yeah. right. But that doesn't clearly state yeah. like you can't use the commercial space for living. Okay. Like the commercial is for commercial. Could be a giant man cave. Matt, yeah, <laughs> think of the right. TV you could get in. <laughs> right, and that's not what we want. Right. Well, it's kind of the antenna number one. Yeah. But yeah, and, it could be more clear. Number and, nine kind of controls it too. The, the point is, like, this is in the industrial zone. We're not just, we don't want how the houses are not allowed in the industrial zone. Yeah. We're interested in allowing live work units as a transition from a residential neighborhood to the industrial neighborhood because now you've got kind of a buffer and a great example is the old um, uh, the old mill along third street so you forget that that property goes all the way up to third street and third street is a residential street so right across the street uh, from those residences, instead of putting industrial right there, live work would be a really good buffer between the residential and, uh, and the industrial uses that will eventually go into the old mill area. Another good example is uh, Sunset, um, the Sunset Industrial Area off of Sunset Park. That backs up to residential area on Henson Court and uh, Heather Lane. Those are not compatible. I mean, we get, over the years, you, you know, the, the dyno shop, the, the race car engine shop, is um, it's not, I mean, it's not well liked by the neighbors. So if you had some sort of buffer in between yeah, 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 where yeah. someone was living and had uh, you know, commercial space, uh, you know, commercial studio or something in there, as a buffer, that would be helpful. And that, no, I'm not picking on that one business. It's a fabulous business to have in town, and it definitely belongs in the industrial zone. I think that was the fault of, you know, the the city to allow industrial right up to to commercial without or to residential without some sort of buffering. All right, planning commission seems kind of silent, so maybe we should go enjoy the rest of our Sunday. Just Sunday, to think more Tuesday. about it is what it comes down to. Anyway, anybody have anything else? Good. 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 Okay, moving on. John, thank you. Cole, thanks. So we have no discussion items on the agenda. So at this particular point, if someone would like to make a motion to adjourn, I'll entertain that. I move we adjourn. Okay, we have a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? A second. You have a second from Commissioner Petto. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting adjourned at 7.49 p.m. Thank you.